what is idolatry? And so, idolatry you've been defining is a sin of the heart in which we love and value something else above God. Okay? It's not simply a physical act because we think about idols as being a physical idol, but it's actually a sin of our heart where we put something more important, anything, person, anything, above God. All right, I had mentioned this last week, I don't know, or last month, I don't know if you remember, kids. We're going to do a sword drill. And you got, if you brought your sword with you, I want you to pull it out. The scripture says the sword is the word of God. It's, it's sharper it's, than any two-edged sword. It's a living, active sword. All right, let's see your swords. If you're yeah, young people, okay. So if you have your swords, you can participate in the sword drill. If you haven't brought your sword today, next integrate, bring it. Yeah, because we want you to learn how to Go and look through God's word for what he says. So in this right now, what I'm going to do is reveal a verse. The first one to find it, raise your hand. And that means you have to stand up and read it. Okay? If you're the first one who stands up and reads it, and I call on you, then there's a prize for you. All right? Okay. Ready? This is all fair. All fair. Okay. Here's your verse. Isaiah 44, 12. See who's the first one to find it. No, young people, young people, young person. Okay, Rui. Rui, stand up. Oh, stand up. You got to stand up. And let it real loud. Is it 2412? Yes. The blacksmith stands at his forge to make a sharp sword, pounding and shaping it with all his mind, his work. Very good. Well done. Give him a hand. Awesome. It's not Pepero Day, but I'm giving you a Pepero. Yes. Well done, sir. Well done. Isaiah 44, 12. Okay. So this blacksmith or iron worker, we see working with his strong arm, but as he creates and makes this idol, spending time to try to bring value to this idol, he doesn't get stronger, he gets weaker. He doesn't get more satisfied, he actually gets hungrier and thirstier. And that is the theme of the text we'll be focusing on today as we wrap up this unit on idolatry in Isaiah 44. So that's our week's reading. If you're following along in the study, Isaiah 44 is your reading for this week. Today, we're going to dip into chapter 43 at the end part, just for some context, and then go right into chapter 44. Let's read today's Bible quote in Psalms 85. It's on your sermon notes, if you're following along. This psalm is a psalm of what's called lament, or in other words, regret. Okay? It's actually kind of the background of where we're going to be in Isaiah today, 40, chapter 40 through 50, around there. And the psalmist remembering is remembering God's past mercies, all that he has done, but also God's judgment because of their continued disobedience, their continued rebellion, idolatry. And so God had used the Babylonians in history to punish the Israelites for their sins. And the psalm is both a cry as well as a celebration for God's restoration revival. And here it is, Psalms 85, verse 6. Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Lord, will you not bring to us life again because we've been only experiencing up to this point death because of our sin, because of our disobedience, because of our wicked. So, Lord, will you give us fresh life again so that that life that we need comes from you. And when we receive that life, we may then be able to have joy in you. So this is a cry and a celebration, which I pray we can all join together also as we read here in Isaiah 43 and 44 in today's message entitled, Waves of Reviving Grace. Waves of reviving grace. And I believe the Holy Spirit will really speak what His heart is 
into ours as well. All right, kids, quiz, true or false? A little bit of a review. Since the kingdom, we're talking about God's kingdom after it was established and then it divided after Solomon, there has been one good king in the northern kingdom. True or false? How many say it's true? One, at least one good king. How many says false? All right, that is the truth. There has been no good kings after the split in the northern kingdom. We, we've been going through first and second kings, and we've seen how each generation of Israelite kings of this northern kingdom led the nation deeper and deeper into idolatry. Even though God had repeatedly warned them and repeatedly shown them, demonstrated that he is more powerful than any other god, right? Remember, Elijah had also shown this on Mount Carmel, that God has incomparable power and greatness over any other god. And even though God showed this, Israel still <clears throat> did not turn away from their idols and worship God. So soon after Mount Carmel, we see Elijah heading to the desert. Here's a true or false for you. So after Mount Carmel, Elijah went to the desert because God told him to go there. True or false? True? False. All right, you guys have been paying attention. It is false. God did not tell I, um, Elijah <laughs> a lot of... A lot of names, these recent. Elijah to go there. In fact, Elijah ran away because he was scared for his life. And he went to the desert to die. <laughs> he got so discouraged, maybe even so disappointed, that all of this demonstration of how God's greatness still did not turn God's people's hearts back to God. And so the Lord fed him. He provided Elijah's shelter, and revived his physical and spiritual life. Many of us also need this from the Lord as well. So at the end of Isaiah 43, we're going to see that the God, God reveals a very important problem in the worship of his people. In fact, in Isaiah 43, the problem isn't Israel not worshiping God. In fact, they are doing all the behaviors of worship. But as he searches their hearts, their worship is not about God at all. They're doing worship-like behavior. But God doesn't find worship in their hearts. Instead, he finds weariness. Weariness, tiredness. Have you ever been tired in your worship of God? Very important question because here's the first point. Weariness in worship points to a problem. It is a problem, but at the very least, it points to a problem. Let's read this in verse 21 of Isaiah 43. I have made Israel for myself, and they will someday honor me before the whole world. But dear family of Jacob, you refuse to ask for my help. You have grown tired of me, O Israel. Wow, what a conviction to be growing tired of God but God makes it clear here in the next verse that he's not the one who has made them tired he hasn't he's not the one who burdened them or wearied them he says in verse 23 you have not brought your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with incense God is not the one making us tired. God is not the one who wearies us. God showed the Israelites very, very specifically what worshiping God looks like. In fact, the whole book of Leviticus, you know what that is? is it's kind of an instruction manual of how to worship God to, ver to the very detail. But even if a person was to follow it to the letter and it becomes just procedural, is that worship? No, that's not worship. When the temple was first built, King Solomon invited all of God's people in this lavish and extravagant worship of God. 
Yeah, and they sacrificed a lot of sheep and oxen. So let me ask you guys, I don't know if this is something you know as a trivia. How many sheep did King Solomon sacrifice to the Lord when the temple was built? It was a lot, but how much a lot? Was it 120? 1,200? 12,000? Or 120,000? We got 120,000. Any other answers? We're going to go back? What? 12,000? Okay, any others? It was around there. The correct answer is D. It was 120,000 sheep. Not only 120,000 sheep, Second Chronicles 7.5 says Solomon offered 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep to dedicate. That's a lot of sheep. So lavish worship, extravagant worship. That's great and all, but there's nothing wrong with it. But if our worship of God, no matter how lavish it is or simple of it, it is, if it turns into simply a joyless duty, this is not what God wants. This doesn't satisfy the Lord. This is not His will for us. God says here at the end of chapter 43 that He is not satisfied by the fat of their sacrifices. Isaiah 43, 21. You have not brought me aromatic cane with silver or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Even if God's people were to bring the fat of more than a hundred thousand sacrifices to him, God would not be satisfied if they still burdened him with their sins. Here's the truth though. God designed the sacrificial system to actually unburden the people of their sin. All right? But yet they're burdening him with their sins. God's design for his sacrifice to him, his worship of him, was to unburden you and to free you, to remove your sins. That is the purpose of worship. Second, second point, worship is meant to revive our hearts and to set us free. That is the purpose of our worship to God, to revive us. What does that mean to revive us? To bring life, God's life into us. It set us free. Because we don't understand this so well because we as human beings, we're so conditioned when we ever hear the word command, we feel free? No, we feel burdened. Because a command feels like we have to. A command feels obligatory. A command feels not like I want to, but I must do. Right? That's how we're conditioned. But the word of the Lord tells us in 1 John, to love God means that we keep His commandments. And God's commandments are not burdensome. God's commands are not burdensome. Why? Because it comes from our love to Him. Here's the thing. Even if you must do something because you love somebody, you're doing it because you want to do it. When it is out of love. Even though we feel like we need to do this because we love that person, it's because we want to. We desire to. We see no other option to, not because we are obliged to, because we love to. And we do so, we follow His commands because we love Him, not out of obligation or fear, but love. So God isn't looking for a worship of Him where it's simply, you know that phrase, grin it and bear it? Yeah? You're going to bring me 100,000 sheep and you're going to like it. You're going to smile about it no matter what. Is that the type of worship the Lord wants? It is not. In fact, he says, I am not satisfied by the fat of your sacrifices. If it's not unburdening you, that is not what 
God desires. In fact, this kind of worship actually can only lead to idolatry because it's unsatisfying to us. Does that make sense? So when that worship of God, where He is, that worship is meant to revive us and set us free, it doesn't because we feel like we are burdened by it for whatever reason we have, then we're not satisfied. So we look to other things to satisfy us. We make worship wrong when we make worship not about God's grace and about whatever it is that makes us weary. Whether that's performance-based thinking, whether it's trying to achieve something, whether it's trying to earn something of God to be approved by Him in one way or the another, or to even obligate God and get Him to do something. I've heard this statement many times. I kept my promise, but God broke, broke His. He broke the deal. Meaning that do this, he would do that, and he didn't. That's wearisome. We make wrong what worship is when we make worship about not about his grace, but whatever it is that makes us weary of him and worshiping him. But we enter into true worship when our hearts are revived through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Listen to that. Our hearts are revived when we, our worship of Him revives our heart through the finished work of Jesus and what He has done for us and not about what we can do for Him. This is a worship that pleases the Lord. A worship that's all about who God is and what He has done, not what I can do, what I have done or not have done. Amen? Isaiah 43, 25 says this, I am the one, I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake, and remember your sins no more. Oh, here, Christian, friend, God wipes away our sins, not because of you, but for His own sake, based off of His own glory based off of who God is. But here's the thing. The Bible tells us Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And do you know every single day, day and night, Satan accuses you and Satan accuses me. And Satan goes before God and says, Hey God, this so-called Christian over here, let me point out to you the same sin that he and she has been doing Again and again. They keep promising again and again. They still Tuesday they did and Thursday. They can't even last a week. You know what God says? I remember them no more. Not for their sake, but for my sake. Because Satan, you have the facts right. Those are true, but you are not telling the whole story. Because what I am interested in is not in their record of the past. What I'm interested most in and what's most important to me is Christ's record for them. That is what God wants you to know. Your worship of Him is not about you. Your worship of Him is about who He is and what God has done for you. This is the grace of God. This is who God is. And in fact, this is how God revives us with His grace and with who He is. The grace of God comes from who He is. In fact, that is how the Lord revives His people with the fullness of Himself. Here's our next point. God revives us by pouring out Himself to you. All of this flows right into chapter 44, which we're going to go in right now. In the first few verses, the Lord assures His people that despite the mess they've made of things, we belong to Him because He made us, He chose us, and He formed us, and so He will help us. 
Even though we transgressed upon His grace, do you know how God responds to your transgressions against His grace? More grace. That doesn't mean that we should sin more so more of His grace will abound, but that's the extravagancy of His grace that He responds to your messing up, to your transgressing of His grace with more of His grace. Even though our sins condemn us, and God can be freed of any obligation to us because of our transgression to Him, <laughs> He doesn't. Instead of turning away from us, He pours out Himself upon us. Hallelujah. For this is what, what we need in our weariness, Christian. This is what we need in our dryness, in our tiredness, in our emptiness. We need God's life. And it's only by His life that we become hydrated and we come to life, that we burst into life. Some of us are walking like dry, dehydrated fruit, dehydrated meat. You know what I'm saying? And you need the life of God. And only by His pouring into us do we burst into life. A life is not a life of trying. It's a life of receiving. Amen? It's a receiving of His life into ours. This is what He says in verse 3 of chapter 44. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I would pour out my Spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. That's us, people of God. Since the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, God has poured Himself upon a guilty and sinful world. His Spirit on His people. And ever since then, there have been the same pouring of God's wonderful Spirit. He continues to pour wave after wave after wave after wave of His reviving grace. Yes, between waves there might be things that we don't see, but there has been war working. We see that in the world today. You know, people have been watching in the news what's happening in Asbury of God's pouring of His Spirit into His people. That's just one place that's gotten news. It's happening all over the world. All over the world. In fact, more closer to us, there in Armenia where God has placed us to be able to work in the hearts of the nations around us. This very thing that you saw today, Awaken, the, the curriculum, we opened that up and there are 500 people from the surrounding Muslim nations coming and saying, we want to take that because we want to know God's heart for the nations. They came together and just the staff was just going to do a worship night out there in the, in the middle of the city. And it was just going to be a few, maybe 20 people. 150 people came, not knowing anything about it, just to worship God and be able to cry out to God for the heart of their own people. For them to see a reviving of God's grace in their lives. This is happening in the world. And I'm saying, God's people, let us be open and wide for the wave of God's grace to revive us so that He fills us and He moves us. This is not of us trying or achieving or being loud or being quiet. It is about simply allowing God's life to be poured into us as His people. And it starts in the way of His Grace and grace alone. God's heart is to renew all things. And renewal comes by His life. The Holy Spirit is what brings new life. The Holy Spirit brings new growth. The Holy Spirit brings new strength towards all that He has for us. God's solution to weary worship is Himself. Amen? Nothing less. And when God's Spirit moves... When His Spirit fills us, here's what happens. 
People get off the sidelines. They stop sitting on the fence. You know what sitting on the fence does to you? It splits your underwear. They get off the fence and they start clamoring to belong to Jesus, to say, I am a part of him. I belong to him. Here, listen to this in verse 5. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will say, and use the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's. I'm the Lord's and take on the name of Israel. This is what happens when the Lord pours over his spirit. People get off the sidelines. They jump off the fence and they say, I want Jesus. That, oh people of God, is what we are opening our wise, our mouth for. Great sinners become great believers. Lukewarm Christians become consumed by God who is our consuming fire. This is what God does when we enter into worship of God of great grace. And then His great grace breaks upon us with reviving power. Reviving power. And why does the Lord do all of this? Why does He give of Himself so much when we do nothing to deserve it when we don't try to do anything, when we're not giving of anything except for ourselves and worship to Him? Well, simply, as we've been going through this part of what we've been studying is to prove that He is greater than any other God, any other idol that has gripped and clogged up our lives. Here's our next point. The Lord proves He is greater than any idol. Isaiah 44, verse 6, this is what the Lord, the King of Israel, and its Redeemer, the Lord of armies, says, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. Here's the thing, in every generation, in every idolatrous generation, oh, God pours out Himself to those who are hungry enough, to those who are thirsty enough, to those who have been awakened of their God-sized hole in your, their hearts. Do you know all of us have a God-sized hole in our heart? Sounds pretty big, right? Well, it is. Well, think about putting a tiny little idol in that God-sized hole. Well, that's what the Lord will do. As He pours out His Spirit, He exposes a tiny little idol that we try to fill with this God-sized hole that only who can fill? God alone. That size hole is for God alone to fill. And He exposes the vast emptiness that we foolishly try to fill with this tiny idol. So you can read, I'm not going to read the rest of these verses. I want you to read this on your own from verse 9 through 20. It basically talks about a person who, who cuts down a tree. Nothing wrong with that because God gave us trees to use. He uses that wood to make a fire to warm himself. Also, very good. Nothing wrong with that. He uses that same fire to cook. Good idea. Fires, you cook some food, yummy food. But then he uses the leftover of that wood, sets it up, bows down to it, and says, You are my God. Save me. Foolish. It's absurd. But it's what we as humans do all the time. We turn created things that only the Creator can give, and we ask that created thing to do it. We love to suck the life out of objects and created things, thinking that it can give us life. And how absurd is that? The entire premise of the Bible and why we talk about idols again and again. And the Bible talks about idolatry being a problem again. And through Isaiah 44, you'll see him talking about idols again and again and again. Why? Because idols are the problem. The whole premise of God's word is basically the rejection of all other gods. There shall be no other gods before me. You shall worship no other god but me. So if it is true that there's only one true God, yet, and I want to ask you this as a question too, yet your experience of being satisfied by this one true God, that worshiping Him alone is less than satisfactory. There's a reason for this. 
because oftentimes there's an idol or idols clogging up our life. Clogging up that channel so we can experience the reviving grace of God. Because here's the thing, the world teaches us that we need multiple gods. That we need choices. It's okay for God to take up a part of our life, but the whole of our life? Come on! This setting is, was in the time of Babylon. When Babylon took Israelites, they were in exile in Babylon. And you know what the word Babylon means? The actual word of Babylon means the gate of the gods. It means the moment you enter into Babylon, you are entering into the gate of the gods. It's a culture and an empire of the worship of many, 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 many gods. And it's the waypoint for multiple gods. And their culture and our culture, the same thing. The message there is, there is not one true God. Sure, God may have a place in your life, but there is no way God is life. That is the message of our culture today. Sure, you can be a Christian, but the way that you're truly going to be experiencing satisfaction and fulfillment in your life is to pursue your dreams, play out of your strengths, get, do what you're passionate about, you know, get this, get that, this thing. That's what's going to really bring life to you. Okay to be a Christian, but one true God to fill you and satisfy you, that the worship of Him to be truly reviving and setting you free? No, 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 no. you got to have more choices than that. Hedge your bets. There's other gods out here for you to actually find true life. It's like investment portfolio, diversity. God says no. I am the only, one and only, true God. And God desires to show that He is greater than every and all gods. And in every generation, He pours out His Spirit upon idolaters who get thirsty enough, hungry enough to drink from Him. And here's our role. Our role is to be God's fearless witnesses in the flesh, living proof that God alone is more than to satisfy. So it begins with us, people of God. Next point, God's people are to be His fearless witnesses. Do you know why Nietzsche decided to reject God? Well, he is a quote. I, I didn't put it up here. One of the reasons that Nietzsche, you guys all heard of Nietzsche, right? Wow, started a whole godless generation, was because he saw his father and his friends, his father's friends at church, with no joy as they served God. She said, I rejected God because I saw them. They didn't have any fun, had any joy. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason that people reject God, but the point is, we have to be satisfied in God. We have to be filling up with His life in order to be the witnesses that He alone is the one true God worthy of all of our worship. And He fills us and He sets us free. Verse 8 says, Do not be startled or afraid. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God but me? There is no other rock. I do not know any. Here's another quiz question as we kind of come to the end of our message. What was the purpose of Elisha's miracles? We talked about Elijah, reviewed Elijah a little bit. We went to Elisha last week. A, to help every person who needs a miracle. B, to show that he was two times better than Elijah. C, to show that he was a prophet of the one true God and God's words were true. Or D, to compete with other gods and idols. Hopefully you understand the, the answer to B. A? No, no. B. B? Go back to school. Review. <laughs> he did get double the portion of God, yeah, Elijah's spirit. C, to show that he was a prophet of the one true God and that God's words were true. In fact, this connects to our Christ connection through this whole series. Here's the Christ connection. God alone is worthy of our worship. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to save us from our sins so that we can turn 
from our idolatry and evil ways to rejoice in the God who saves. To rejoice in the God who saves. This is our purpose. God fills us with His Spirit so that we can show the world that Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life like we sang this morning. That He is the only way. He's the only truth and life. But for those of us who have idols clogging up our life, clogging up the inflow of God's reviving power, I say simply, let go and let God. Let go and let God fill you. And if you're empty, just say, God, pour. 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 The more empty you are and the more emptiness that you bring into before Him, the more He will pour into you. That's the beauty of what you bring to the Lord. He's not looking for you to bring your fullness. He's actually looking for you to bring your emptiness so He can fill you. That's what He desires. And sometimes that emptiness is painful. Sometimes we've shut it. Sometimes we've locked it. Sometimes we put it in the dark and say, never again. But God says, bring it. He says, bring it, open it, unlock it, and I will lighten it, I will fill it, I will bring my life and I pour into it, and you will not know of any other life like this. And this worship of Him is what allows you to be a witness, to say, God alone is worthy of our worship, because He satisfies to the depth that no other thing in this world can. So turn away from those things and turn to Him alone. This is the cry of God's people and the celebration as well. He wants to pour Himself right into us. There's nothing to deserve. There's nothing to earn. It's just Him who invites us, who draws us. This is the way to God's reviving grace. This is the way into rejoicing in Him. So, last point, return to the Lord, for He has redeemed us. That's the truth. Verse 22, I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Rejoice, heavens, for the Lord has acted. Shout, depths of the earth break out into singing mountains forests and every tree in it for the lord has redeemed jacob and glorifies himself through israel all of creation will join with you as you know the reviving power of the grace of god the life we deeply long for only comes in him from him so I pray that each of us turns to Him. Each of us simply just lets Him pour into our lives. Again, it doesn't matter what you are doing. It doesn't matter what you have done. You just come. Let Him touch you. Let Him love you. Let Him bring His waves of grace into you. The worship True worship experiences when you experience the reviving power of His grace to you. So will you now revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Yes. Father, we pray, Father, for this pouring of your Spirit into our hearts. Lord, you have deposited us already into us, your Holy Spirit. And it's not something external within us. It's actually, Father, you've already done this powerful, miraculous work. The biggest miracle of all for you, Holy Spirit, to dwell within us. But for those who are weary in our worship, I pray we come in all of our dryness so that you will fill us, so that you will immerse us, that we will be a saturated people of God, O oh Lord. Father, we bring to you our worship now. We bring to you our heart of worship. 
Make it all about you and nothing else. Show us what it means that you are the one and only true God, that you are greater than any idol, any God, and you're the one who satisfies alone. Holy Spirit, work. Fill us. Free us. Revive us, O oh Lord, that we may rejoice in you, O oh God. Pray. Pray right now. And just anybody who wants to join me in this moment. I mean, we talked about there's, there's what we bring to him. And if anyone's here right now that the Lord is speaking to, you need a pouring in it into these areas, into the dark places, into the vast emptiness that you've locked away, that you it's so painful to be able to even think about going near. But you you know the Lord is speaking to you. You know that He wants you to bring this to Him. I want to pray for you right now. I just want you to open up your heart, open up your hands. And I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, you will pour, pour into their hearts. Father, I pray your your healing mercy and Father, your reviving grace to just pour right now. And Father, fill, fill this place, oh God. And Father, in the place of pain, I pray, Father, for your wonderful balm. And Father, in the place of emptiness, Father, I pray for your filling in Jesus' name. Father, that Lord, you will cover you will cover and you will provide a protection that there will be a peace right now, a peace of your incredible presence, a wonderful feeling of your spirit. And Lord, that you will be the one who does the marvelous, that you be the one who brings your life. Poor Jesus, in the name of Jesus, poor, I pray. And Lord, I, I just had you put on my heart for... If, you're, if you identify with this and you know that there is a habitual sin and you're so tired of it again and again and again and you've done everything you can to try to get rid of it, I believe the Lord says, take your eyes off that, put your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me, the author and perfecter of your faith. That I'm sufficient, my grace is sufficient for you. Grace is sufficient for you. And that is not what I look at. I look at my, my son in you. And open up this place where you have, you have done it on your own strength. Open up this place and just turn to, turn to him. Turn to him right now. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you pour. Pray you pour with the power of your grace right now. That Lord, there will be a releasing in the name of Jesus. And in the, in the place of wherever dependency and addiction may be, in the name of Jesus, we pray for your freedom. Hallelujah. And that, Father, that your power break forth through your grace. A grace that frees, a grace that fills, a grace that heals, a grace that full, fills to the full. In the name of Jesus, open wide, open wide everything that you are. And let the Lord do what he does. Let him be your victor. Let Him be the one who conquers. Let Him be your strength. Jesus, poor. Jesus, we need your life. We need your life to worship you. We bless you today. This day is all of yours. I pray that, Lord, as you stir us, that we will pray for one another and receive prayer as well. So God, we may be able to agree with you and what you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.